Okay. That means we go into the sermon. May the grace, mercy, and peace that come from God the Father be yours through Jesus Christ, his Son. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, all too often we get the idea that we are observers at church and not really responsible for anything. We fail to see that you have expectations of us. Through your word today, help us to see the role you have carved out for us in the ministry of your church. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Recently, I have unraveled a great mystery in the church. Uh, I know this service is different, but in the other service, we normally have three readings, Old Testament, Epistle lesson, and Gospel lesson. Uh, and as much as I try, often I could not tell you what the connection was between those three readings even if my life depended on it. So I have a theory. This is, this is unraveling this mystery. Here's what happened. Somewhere there was a big wall as big as the side of a barn. Uh, and someone took a Bible and cut up the Old Testament and put all those pages over here on the left and then it took the epistle lessons and put all those in the middle and then took the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and cut those up, put those on the right. Then someone had the duty of throwing darts at this wall. Uh, and they, the darts were in sets of three. So for the first week of the year, all the darts had the number one on them. And number two darts, number three, all the way up to the end. So if you were on week 24 in the church year, then you would look for all the darts with the number 24 on them, and you would have your three readings. Uh, and after uh, everything was done, we had all these lists of the three readings. Well, in actual fact, that's not really what happened. But at times it would seem that way because it's hard to see a relationship between the readings. However, today, all the readings fit together very nicely. And that's why Mark read all three of them because we're going to go back and look at them in more depth. Mark also gave you a little introduction to each and that will help us in our understanding. And then, lest you be disappointed, the homework assignment, can't forget that. Look on the back of your prayer sheet in your bulletin, and there are some places for sermon notes. For each of the three readings, try to get what the main idea is and write that down and put other notes if you wish. But the, the main thing I want to tell you is, take those notes, take them home and read them, and also read the three readings again. So you get this firmly ingrained in your mind, what we are learning today. So let's get started with the Old Testament lesson, which was from Isaiah chapter 55, beginning at the first verse. And part of that read, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You have no have, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Well, it's very easy to understand. This is an invitation. The scene picture here is like a market scene in many countries where they have open markets. The scene would be the same. You pass down the aisle. <coughs> excuse me. Ten, Vendors on both sides are trying to get your attention to sell their wares. And in this scene, the vendors are selling bread, wine, milk, water. All of them are being offered. It's probably similar to the markets that we saw in West Africa. The same kind of thing that women would go around with things on their heads or 
in baskets or in stalls that they would have things to sell, it was common to hear some woman going around with some little bags of drinking water on her head in a pan. And she would be calling out, AC glacé, AC glacé, ice water, ice water. And people would come and buy. So this is the kind of scene that we're looking at here. Now the invitation in this passage is from God himself. He's inviting people to come forward and feast on the, the salvation, the free salvation <clears throat> that he is offering. Verse 2 of this passage says, uh, Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen to me. Listen and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the rich, rich fare. In Isaiah's time, as in our own time, people go after false gods. People go to things that are not the truth of God's word. God says, why spend money on what is not bread? Why follow after these false gods and these false prophets? who are worth nothing. He's saying that this can only lead to your destruction. This invitation is a joyful one about salvation, and not just salvation, free salvation through the Messiah that God had promised to his people. But sadly, Israel rejected this invitation they rejected Isaiah, God's prophet, and they rejected God himself. They rejected the salvation that God offered them. Okay, now fast forward to the time of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a Jew, but the Lord led him to faith in Jesus Christ. Now he was concerned about his people who continue to reject the promise of salvation. As Mark pointed out, this, the, this excerpt from his letter to the Romans is an impassioned plea. With all his heart, Paul would like to see his fellow Jews repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Listen again to part of what Paul said. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, of those of my own race, the people of Israel. But you understand that? Paul is saying that he would give up his own salvation if it would bring his people, the Jews, to faith in Christ. Have you ever felt that strongly about anyone? Do you grieve over someone who rejects Christ? Do you, re re do you grieve over this person so much that you would sacrifice your salvation for that person? Or do we even care? Do we care that people all around us are on a fast track to hell? This doesn't sound really like what the Apostle Paul is talking about in the epistle to the Philippians, where he told the Christians to have the same attitude that Christ had. Christ desired our salvation. He de God hurled at Jesus all the punishment that should have been yours and mine, all the punishment that the whole world deserved. Christ suffered the pangs of hell. Do you remember when he was on the cross and he called out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ, the Son of God, 
was experiencing complete separation from God the Father. He was experiencing hell for us and in our place so that we would not have to experience it. Our passion for the souls of the lost should be no less than that of Paul. It should tear us up to see people enslaved by sin. We should be at the point of tears when we see people wandering around without hope. We should be overcome with sadness when we see people drop out of the Christian community because they've found something more interesting or more important or something to replace God. If we think about this, we can begin to understand God's or Paul's anguish. He had a heavy heart when he penned these words of the epistle lesson. And I guarantee you that Paul knew the words of Isaiah chapter 55. He knew of this invitation. And he knew that the people of Israel rejected it back in Isaiah's time. And they continued to reject it in Paul's time. Paul knew what they had turned down. And this caused him great torment. A bit ago, we suggested that we should feel badly about those who reject God's invitation to receive salvation. Well, the next logical step is to say, what can we do about this? We seek the answer in our gospel lesson. The gospel lesson comes from Matthew chapter 14. In the opening verses of this chapter, we see how Herod had executed John the Baptist. People could be very cruel back then. And Herod would certainly be in the top 10 of cruel people. Then comes our gospel lesson. Jesus hears what's happened. He hears that they executed John the Baptist and he decides to withdraw to an isolated place. Was he afraid of Herod? Was he running away? Absolutely not. He was saddened by the loss of a family member. They were distant cousins. They were, he was saddened by the loss of a friend. And he was saddened by the loss of a colleague because they were both on a mission from God. So most assuredly, now he needs some downtime, some alone time. Now we can find this account uh, in our gospel lesson in three of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And from each one of these accounts, we pick up a little more detail and we get a complete picture. Uh, when Jesus decided to go to an isolated place, he got in a boat and uh, he was heading out he was heading toward the town of Bethsaida. The people saw him leaving and they followed along the Sea of Galilee on the shore and they met him at Bethsaida. <clears throat> Matthew reports that Jesus healed their sick in a group the size that we're talking about, 5,000 men plus women and children. Uh, there had to be a lot of people needing healing. Uh, and Jesus healed them. Ma uh, Mark tells us that Jesus did a lot of teaching. The people there did not know of God and his love for them, the invitation to salvation, and Jesus was laying that out for them. However, there's one aspect to these three accounts in the three Gospels that is the same. In fact, it is exactly the same words in each one. So we take, we will, we want to take a look at this. Uh, so Jesus has compassion on the people. Remember, he wanted to be just alone. But all these people come, 5,000 or more of them. And he begins 
to minister to those. He heals their sick and he teaches them from God's word. As he teaches, the crowd grows and grows. It was a long day, probably hot, and evening was approaching. The disciples, they'd had it. They were wiped out. And they're probably getting very hungry. So they you know, said, we've got to draw this to a close. So they said, Jesus, you know, it would probably be a good idea about now if you'd send the people away to the towns nearby. They can go there and get something to eat. And Jesus responds, they don't have to go away. You give them something to eat. And if you look at the three accounts, you'll find these words, the same words in all three accounts. You give them something to eat. Now you can imagine what the disciples are thinking. Jesus, you must be crazy. It would take more than a year's wages to buy enough Jimmy Johns to feed a crowd like this. And we'd need a whole line of donkey carts to carry the Domino's pizza that we would need. They tell Jesus they have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Now I can guarantee you if those fish were like anything I catch, they wouldn't go very far. The bottom line is the disciples are thinking, no way. The invitation that we heard in Isaiah is still open. God still offers free salvation to all who believe in Jesus. And just as in Paul's time, there are many who reject this invitation. And there are people who do not even know that this invitation is out there. How are we going to reach them? Well, hold on, Walt. You, you know, these people live in faraway lands. There's nothing we could do to pay the travel costs for doing that. Wrong answer. These people live next door to you. You go to the same grocery stores they do. Your kids go to school with their kids. You work with them. No, they're not in faraway places. They're right here. And this invitation to free salvation is extended to them. These people may have never heard of God's invitation. And they're wandering around like sheep without a, a shepherd. They need to be fed that invitation and the hope of the gospel message. And who will do that? Jesus told his disciples, you give them something to eat. And Jesus says the very same thing today. You give them something to eat. Now, wait a minute, Walt. You're way, way off base here. When it comes to talking about this Jesus stuff, that's why we hire pastors. That's their job to go out and tell people about Jesus. Wrong answer. Jesus didn't say, call Rulins and order up some food. He didn't say, run by Kentucky Fried Chicken and get some buckets of extra crispy. He didn't say, go for Chinese, Chinese carryout. What did Jesus do? He said, you give them something to eat. And he trained them in the work that he was asking them to do. Yes, we have pastors. But their main job is to train us, to equip us for carrying the gospel message out to people. When Jesus said, who, "This, who, you give them something to eat, who all is included? It includes everyone last, every last one of us. If you are breathing and have a pulse, God wants you to share the gospel. If you, if you want, you can take a little check on that right now. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And then put two fingers across your wrist. And if you feel that little thump, 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 uh, you're, you're qualified. You're right in there. You can do this. Remember that Jesus said to all of his disciples that day, you give them something to eat. He didn't say, well, let me see, uh, Peter, 
why don't you and John give them something to eat? No. He said to the whole group, you give them something to eat. And there are no age limits in this. You're never, ever too old to share the gospel. And you're never too young to begin sharing it. I, uh, about two months ago now, uh, I was asked to do a graveside ceremony for a lady. Uh, I think she was 102 years old and uh, she had been a member at St. Paul before she had moved away and they brought her remains back here. Uh, and even at 100 years plus, she just found great joy in sharing her faith. It was never a burden. She was just happy to open that up to people. And she did it all the way up to the end of her life. Well, Walt, that all sounds good, but uh, you went to seminary. I did not. So you're equipped to do this. I can't do this. Well, step right up because I have Walt's wonderful witnessing program all ready for you. Do you believe that you are a sinner? Do you believe that you deserve nothing but God's wrath? Do you believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, suffered your punishment, the punishment you deserve, and he died on the cross? Do you believe that Jesus rose again from the dead to show that he had conquered death? If you can answer yes to these questions, you are fully qualified to share your faith. Notice that Jesus did not tell his disciples to force people to eat. No, he said, you give them something to eat. Now, if the people there that day didn't want to eat, that's fine, that's okay. But he said, you give them something to eat. Our task is to share our faith, the good news of Jesus Christ. And we cannot force people to believe. Likewise, we cannot convince people of the truth of our message. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. So when we're sharing our faith, we're not working alone. We have a team working with us. We have the Holy Spirit working with us. Jesus just says to us, you give them something to eat. Amen.